everybody. Uh, I'm going to go not very long on this. I don't want to teach the quarterly, but I'm going to tell you about it. Uh, and some of the process that I went through and uh, maybe give you some ideas. To begin with, this is what the cover is going to look like. They have not printed it yet but this is the companion book that goes with it and each of you will get a copy of this and uh, when I wrote the quarterly it started with me walking the halls here one morning and I saw Cliff Goldstein and I said Cliff why don't you write me a book on how you managed money in your life he said absolutely not why don't you write me a Sabbath school quarterly on stewardship <laughs> No is not an option for me in many things. So I spent a considerable amount of time thinking about this topic. I don't know very much, but I knew enough to uh, satisfy Cliff. <laughs> However, it went through about five editors before I gave it to Cliff. And he cut about 50% of it out. So I looked at what he cut out and what he replaced it with, and I thought, this is an editor. This stuff is just as good as what he wrote. And so uh, when Derek Morris was in the process of getting ready to teach the Sabbath school class uh, at the Hope Channel, he said, when I read your, uh, your quarterly, John, I see a portion that I like. He would think, John wrote it. If he saw something he didn't like, he said, the editors must have done it. <laughs> now, Cliff is a very smart man, a good editor, and an editor has the right to do that. Uh, and uh, because this is a document that having gone through this process, in my opinion, the Sabbath School Quarterly is probably the most refined, most polished, the most, uh, or probably the best resource the Seventh-day Adventist Church produces worldwide because it has so many eyes trying to meet so many different cultures. Having thought about that, I decided, well, who's going to write the companion book? They said, would you like to write the teacher's quarterly? I said, no, I don't want to write the teacher's quarterly. But I'll write the companion book because I want to edit back into the companion book what the editors cut out. So if you want to get kind of a complete picture of what I think, uh, uh, enjoy. And uh, so, to begin with, just a couple of comments as I sit there and listen to uh, the presentations this morning. Uh, in the quarterly, we talk about uh, habits of, of a steward. When it comes to this topic, I decided I was going to disagree with anybody I've ever read, whether they are Adventist or non-Adventist, on the topic of stewardship. They've got so many definitions as to what stewardship is. When I first got here, I did a, a, a piece of research and we came to the conclusion that uh, Adventists have a sophisticated concept of stewardship, but we're lost in the big picture. So whenever they say stewardship is not about money, I say, yes, it is. We wouldn't be talking about it if it wasn't. They say, stewardship is all about relationship. I say, no, it isn't. It's about money. So I'm just turning this thing upside down and backwards for my own amusement. Uh, and uh, uh, I thought as I read all the quarterlies the church produced on the topic of stewardship, the last one was written in 1974. I was not even out of academy 
That's way too long. So please make the best of this quarterly as good or as bad as it is because it'll be a long time before they ever write another one. And I discovered that all these quarterlies they had written over the years followed a certain pattern. They would start out usually with God as the owner and, and start, you know, very traditional. And uh, while that is good, I decided as, after reading some things, when I go to church, I'm not thinking about God is the owner. Neither are your church members. Church members go to church today thinking, what bang for my buck am I going to get? I had a guy call me. He said, John, can't you get us a better pastor? I'm paying this guy's salary. I can't stand these sermons. Is this as good as it's going to get? So people do not come to church with warm, fuzzy feelings. So I decided to start out with what culture is like. And this is a nice way to just pick up on what uh, Aka was saying. Take a little different perspective on it. Uh, I want to find out the chaos that we live in in this world. When people come to church, they're living in a world of chaos. My original title for this quarterly was to be called From Chaos to Contentment. And they said, well, we're just going to call it stewardship. I said, you're killing it. This thing's dead before it ever gets to press. So in the meantime, I was getting, to, getting acquainted with, uh, uh, not sure we knew it was happening then, but uh, my associate, Benita Shields, she says, let me work on it. So she suggested, in, in addition to the word stewardship, we put motives of the heart. So that is about as good as it gets, but... Uh, um, I would really, I, I think uh, the South American division uh, is going to use the title from chaos to contentment. <laughs> so that's what I saw in the contract. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, some of these things. Before I do, I want to give you my definition of stewardship. It's one among many, but I decided if they can come up with it, so can I. Stewardship is the management of tangible and intangible possessions for God's glory. Now, you know what tangible is. That's money, houses, clothes, shoes, tools, all that stuff we see. Intangible possessions, what's that? Just think of... Uh, Paul saying, put on the whole armor of God. What is it? The helmet of what? The shield of what? The sword of what? Even the shoes. Those are intangible possessions and God did not say, you can borrow them a while. He says, put them on. And if you want to do a, a word study, uh, look up uh, the words we have. In New Testament, maybe Old Testament. I'll just think of a couple of texts. We have, what, a more sure word of prophecy. That's intangible. We have peace with God. That's intangible. We are to manage intangible possessions. So one reason I think people don't like stewardship is because it requires responsibility. It requires us to be able to manage what God has entrusted to us. And some of you do it really lousy. I do it lousy. On occasion I do it good, but most of the time I do it lousy. So we manage tangible and intangible possessions for God's glory. That's my definition. Also, I discovered that in the Sunday keeping world, they do not believe you need to return tithe. There's a few of them that still teach it, but generally speaking, your mega churches in the U.S., they don't believe you need to return tithe because that's part of the old covenant. So what do they have left? They have a culture of generosity. When you hear that phrase, 
It's coming out of the Sunday keeping thinkers. I have argued with myself. I've tried to turn that upside down and, and, and I finally just passed a few weeks. I just got back from Quebec talking to them up there and I came up with what would help us. We ought as Seventh-day Adventist to promote a culture of gratitude. The reason I say that is because gratitude is where, and people's ingratitude is where they get off the track. And they don't want to give because they're not very grateful. Because there's a sequence when it comes to offerings. I respond to a gift that I don't deserve, which is salvation. I have, I'm a grateful heart. If I'm not grateful for that gift, the next step won't happen because the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. So I accept the gift I don't deserve. Now I'm grateful. Now the next step is to be generous. I'll never be generous unless I'm grateful. The next step after generous is to make a sacrifice because I've got to bring an offering to God without spot or blemish. I don't bring animals. How do I bring money? It's when it costs me something. Jesus said to those uh, people when the widow was putting her two coins in, they're giving out of their plenty. Most of us Adventists, we give out of our plenty. It doesn't cost us very much. Now, I was uh, with Marcos in Malawi a few weeks ago, and uh, they have the same problem we have over here in this country. One of the poorest countries in the world. They have the same problem. They assigned to me a church of about 1,400 members, and they said about 200 of them returned tithe and offerings. Well, you've got the same problem over here. Um, one of our universities closed. I asked the president, did your tithes go down? He said, no, they went up. I said, what gives? Uh, well, the, the teachers were not returning tithe to the conference. Maybe they were returning it someplace else. What's interesting is the more education you have, the less likely you will want to give because you'll become cynical, you'll become mistrusting, and you'll really have a problem with your gratitude. So gratitude is the key. Besides, if you ever get into a fight with an elder or a deacon or anybody in church, they cannot fight you back if they have a grateful heart. So a culture of gratitude. Um, by the way, uh, I've appreciated getting to read the books and uh, the, the uh, thrust of the Quinquidium, God First, absolutely. But will a person return God, return to God tithe and offering if they get to know Him first? Okay, I'm going to just turn it upside down. <laughs> No. Theoretically, yes. But we don't live in a, th a theoretical world. We live in an emotional world where I don't feel like getting up early in the morning either. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite things to do is sleeping late in the morning. I was awake at 2 o'clock this morning, Marcos, and I did not get out of bed. <laughs> I did whatever Generation Z person would do, and I looked at Facebook. <laughs> That's terrible to do. So I was emailing people back and forth, responding to them. If you want people to have money to give, you and I need to become experts and proficient in teaching them how to manage their money, period. But we don't even manage our own money. Let me just ask the question. If you were to get out of debt right now, if I said, okay, out of debt, do you have enough money to liquidate all your debt right now? If you do, 
you're in good shape. If you're not, you have, you're, you're a person like, uh, you got concrete shoes. You got shoes on with concrete in them. You can't move. You're stuck. You are a servant to the lender. Uh, some, a uh, few years ago, they did some research. How much interest do people pay in the United States from their credit cards? And it was 14%. Well, there's your tithe and offering probably right there. So one of the chapters in the quarterly is on debt. In the whole world of family finance, doesn't matter who's teaching it, the best thing you can do is to get out of debt. So I asked these people over in Malawi, do they have debt over here? He said, yes. They actually sell their children so they can have money. We got the best message in the world and we really screw it up. We somehow don't teach people enough to where they can say, okay, I understand what you're saying, but I can remember for years, I'd hear stewardship people say, you gotta have a budget. And I said, I don't know how to make a budget. How do you make a budget? You go to the internet and type in family budget and there's hundreds or thousands of these things. So I was looking at uh, the average $60,000 uh, income of a person in the US. Did you know that when you hit about $70,000 of income, your level of happiness starts to taper off? In other words, I could give you $100,000 free and clear and your happiness would increase only by 3%. And you say, well, why don't you give me a try? You know what that is? Half of a hundred. You know what that is? Do you believe I'd give this to you? Or this? Huh? So you think I'd give this to you? I know you would give it to me. You don't know me as well as you think you know me. <laughs> I don't have time to finish this. But usually there's two questions. First of all, if I were to really do this, and this is teaching, so I'm not going to do it. I'm going to teach you how to do it because I'm not going to give this away to you. Incidentally, that's the 50 I got from you, Marcos, in uh, Africa. <laughs> if I say, on hell. You believe I would give it to you? He's told me yes. yes. <laughs> then I would say, you have just answered 50% of the questions to get this. So I'll put the $1 away. Do you believe that I can tell you where you bought your shoes? Yes. You're calling my bluff, aren't you? I've done this lots of places, and people will say, no, no, you can't, you can't. I got on my knees for one lady. I said, please say yes. She says, I can't, you can't. So I can tell every one of you where you got your shoes. You got them at a shoe store. You have to be careful with this, but if you know, if this was a 20, I would have given it to you. Some people will say, no, I don't believe, I don't believe. Just think how God thinks of us when he says, I'll give you eternal life. Just think, there's some good theologians in here. What is the interest rate of heaven? It's 10,000%. And people will not let this go. So I start out, the first two chapters was the hardest ones for the editors. So the first one has to do with the influence of materialism. 
Now let me go through this real quick. Money's the god of this world. Materialism is its religion. Consumerism is the sanctuary that we gather in to worship. And incidentally, consumerism is the greatest threat to the Adventist church, not Catholic theology. Now it may be someday, but consumerism. It started about 1955. We looked at 100 years of tithe in the North American division. And 1955 was about the zenith. It's been going down per capita every year till we're hitting at 16%. Look what we do in the world with only 16%. What happened in 1955? You had cars, you had retailers, you had houses, you had television, and there's the four legs of the stool of consumerism. So retailers are very good at separating you from your money. So money's the god of this world. Materialism is its religion. Materialism is just stuff. Consumerism is more stuff. I don't get enough. TV is the evangelistic arm of materialism. How about this? Sex is the mysticism of materialism. And you're going to say, you are absolutely nuts. No, I'm not. At home, I have a nice 2016 Mustang GT, 423 horsepower, brand new. Yesterday, on the access road, I was at 120, and it was ready to go on. Why do I have such a car? Because my wife said I could have it. It's the first new car I've had since I was 25 years old. So I just didn't go out and borrow money and do all this kind of stuff. I repaired my cars. I've worked on them. I've been one salary in a preacher's family. But if you buy these cars, there's a person standing next to it and there's chemistry going back and forth, off the page, off the TV, and we respond. The, the, the retailers call it the concept, but to just so you'll understand, they know that sex sells. Now, I was looking and researching the internet. Here comes this commercial. Young man and woman, they're twirling around, dancing, having a wonderful time, and uh, flashes a uh, picture to the product, and they, the, she goes through the double doors and changes into an evening gown. He comes through the double doors, he's got the girl, and they're twirling around, everybody's so happy, and the last picture you see is a picture of a water faucet. I don't want that to be the mysticism of my experience. I want my, neither do I want it to be the mysticism of the East. I want to fill my mind with wonderful thoughts of Scripture, the law of God, the Lord and Savior, what He's done for us. If your religion is a mystic, you're done. You're cooked. Trying to sell a water faucet. Narcissism is the personality disorder. This stuff will make you think you're somebody you're not. Look, I know exactly what I'm talking about. I could teach every single one of you how to be a millionaire. But whether or not you could achieve it would be your problem. And I'm speaking from experience. Hoarding is the futility of materialism. In other words, we blend our identity with our possessions. They have TV programs about this. I don't want my identity blended with any of the possessions I have. I want it blended with Christ. And the Sunday keeping world will tell you that the antidote for this is giving. So here again, I go. Turn it upside down. No, it's not. Because you can corrupt the gift, you can corrupt the giver, you can corrupt the recipient. And I can tell you stories. What's the antidote? Zechariah 4, 6. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. So that's week number one. Week number two, and incidentally, these, the art that you see here, you're welcome to have it. This is the artwork from the Collegiate Quarterly. They really did a nice job, and I've asked the guy to colorize these. So he's in the process of doing that, and he's, he sent me four, and 
you can see a little bit there. So this is that artist's uh, perception of the quarterly. So week number two is I see, I want, I take. Or materialistic Christians. It's interesting. Two people. Eve, she went to the tree. She saw, she desired, she took. Achan, he saw the Babylonian garment. What did he do? He saw, he wanted, he took. What do you guys do? You have a trip to the mall. Is it tonight or tomorrow night? <laughs> you can go. I'm not going. I've been to the malls here. <laughs> Are you going to see? Are you going to want? Are you going to take? <laughs> this $50? Yeah. No, I've got to use that to put gasoline in my car. <laughs> Week number three, I originally wanted to have week number three, what's God's perspective? The first two weeks, this is the soup that we are in. What's God's perspective? But they ch changed it and said, okay, God or mammon. So the soup, God's perspective, he said, oh, here, here's God's perspective on it. You can't serve two masters. Money is the only competitor God has. I'm the creator, I'm the God-man, I'm the redeemer, I'm the owner of the universe. Do you know how many cows there are in the world? 1.5 billion. Most of them live in India. If you're a cow here or in Canada, it is not a good outcome. But God says, that's not a problem, I own them all. And then, here's the one I like. I think it's Exodus 9:14 saying this to Pharaoh. Nobody is like me. I don't sleep. I don't eat. If I did, I wouldn't tell you. That's God's perspective on all this chasing after the materialism of the world. Number four, week four, escape from the world's ways. What I wanted to call this is, okay, what is our hope for escape? This is easy. Commitment to a relationship with God. Incidentally, if you want to get out of debt, you'll never get out of debt unless you make a commitment to do so. You'll never live within your means unless you make a commitment. So how do we escape materialism? Bible study, prayer, wisdom, understanding. And listen at this. Duty and love versus hate and rebellion. That's what the world has to offer. Duty and love can do anything, but hate and rebellion will put you on the track to take the life of Jesus. So you go to uh, week number five. I wanted to call this reinstated stewards but they said, we're going to call it stewards after Eden. So, <clears throat> I operate on the premise that you're a born steward. You might not be a good one, but you were born that way. We were made that way. It started in Eden. And uh, when Adam and Eve fell, they were bad stewards, but when you accept Christ again, one definition of stewardship that the Sunday keeping people say is everything you do, stewardship is everything you do after you say yes to Jesus. What they're saying is we have been reinstated as God's steward. Before that, it doesn't matter. So, Stewardship after Eden, we talk about stewards in the Old Testament, stewards in the New Testament, stewards of the mysteries of grace, the tangible possessions, and intangible possessions. Uh, so we start unpacking that a little bit. You go to lesson number six. What is a steward's brand? What are we known for? There's a number of things that a steward is known for. One of the most clear is where it says, we should be faithful, right? 
So what's the difference? Here's what you're going to look at that week. Faithful, loyal, obedient, clear conscience, accountability. They are all shades of the same thing, but they have different aspects, different meanings to them. For example, one of them is trustworthy. Are you a trustworthy person? Over in Malawi, they stole my computer. It was on the communion table. <laughs> it is funny now, but it wasn't at the time. <laughs> I just hope that uh, whoever gets into it will read some of the topics on trust and faith and honesty. And <laughs> but what's trustworthy? Are you a trustworthy person? Trustworthiness is what somebody else thinks of you. Uh, it's what others think of us. So if we go to work, do people consider us trustworthy? Um, the marks of a steward. Let's go to week number seven. Have you ever heard of a chiastic structure in Hebrew? They don't have such a thing in English, but I tried one in English. <laughs> this quarterly, guess what is at the middle of the pyramid? Honesty. That's my English chiastic structure, and I'm sure some Hebrew writer and scholar would turn over in their grave. Honesty with God. Honesty revives spiritual life. You have tithe is holy. You know, I hear leaders talk about revival and reformation. Do you guys know what that is? What's revival? What's reformation? I've heard that all my life and I finally decided to go look it up to see what it meant. Revival means you have a relationship with the Lord and reformation means you have made some changes. And when it comes to tithe and offering, it's a real terrible slap in the face when we talk about revival and reformation when the majority of Adventists are not faithful in returning to God or being honest. As a matter of fact, here's what I, I tried to pin down. If I have revival and reformation and no tithe, I'm Laodicean. If I have tithe without revival and reformation, I'm a legalist. You've heard the text, prove me now herewith, or try me now herewith. Do you know what now is? It means now. Me, do you know what me means? Me, that's God. Herewith, they're just kind of connecting the sentences that leaves us to prove. That's the only word left. When I was studying this, that took me to logic. I went into a cliff one day and he said, I'm working on a PhD in classical logic. I thought, oh heavens. Well, let me explain to you, Cliff, logic 101. <laughs> <laughs> he listened, he said, pretty good, John, pretty good. Logic has two components. <clears throat> so I'll explain them briefly. First of all, if an atheist says there's no God, if there's a negative, said about a positive, that means the positive is true. So if an atheist says there's no God, that means there's a God. Because if there wasn't a God, how did the atheist know to say there was no God if there was no God? So if you say, you don't have to tithe, it's Old Testament stuff, that means you have to tithe. Because if you didn't have to, how did they know to say you don't have to, if you didn't have to? But then the logic falls apart because somebody will say there's no such thing as a unicorn, which means there's probably a unicorn. So the logic falls apart. That's where the second part of this comes in. Evidence. What is the evidence for God? Atheists don't give a care. But what's the evidence for God? It's nature. It's the eyeball. On and on and on. There's evidence for God. Evidence for God is, uh, what's the evidence for returning a tithe? Nobody in their right mind would give this, do this. 
except they have a converted heart. That's the evidence. What about the unicorn? Where's the evidence? There's no evidence. So for logic, you've got to have both of those. Then number eight, the impact of tithing. Uh, that talks about the blessing of tithe. There's three words in Ellen White's. I always miss one of them. Three words. Money equals souls. Never forget that. Money equals souls. It's either the word equals or it means. Money means souls or money equals souls. We talk about the storehouse. Um, we talk about the tree of good and evil. Then number nine, we talk about offerings. And this is where we get into uh, the offerings and based on our generosity, our gratitude, uh, and how that takes place, how you can know how to, how to look for a cheerful giver. It has to respond to the gift, gratitude, generosity, sacrifice, then the cheerfulness starts. Number 10, the role of stewardship. I really like this one. I've been thinking about this idea ever since I was in seminary. I saw my, a sermon I was trying to write in seminary about this. Here's the role of stewardship, in brief. Think of a wagon wheel, like a Conestoga wagon wheel that went across the United States. The axle is Christ. I've had this conversation with Fernando Canale. He said, John, there's your 150 page book there. I said, that's easy for you to say, but I, it's in there. I just need you to help me write that. You know. <laughs> the axle is Christ. Everything revolves around Him. The hub of the wheel is the sanctuary doctrine by which we do our hermeneutics. It's a lens that we look through. And this is where sometimes you'll get pushback and there's a slippery slope because some people say the hermeneutics that we need to use is Christology. And I'm just going to let you guys decide that. I'm going to go with the sanctuary doctrine. Then there's the spokes of the wheel. Those are the doctrines, the beliefs, the values, all the different things that we believe. They've all got to be plugged into Christ. Then you have the rim. That is the three angels message for mission. You don't have a wheel stand stationary. It is not designed to stay stationary. When they made these wheels and they were going fast and they had turned, they had fall apart. The Romans discovered that if they would dish the spokes, put them at an angle, they could turn real fast and they wouldn't fall apart. The spokes actually act as a brace for the wheel. So the doctrines and the teachings that we have are braces for our entire framework. Three angels message for mission. Then the tire, the iron band that goes around this, that's stewardship. Or sometimes I call it practical sanctification. It's not sanctification, it's practical sanctification. It is when I don't feel like going and preaching. You know, this morning I thought, Marcos, ah, do I have to do this? Do I have to get up and talk? I don't want to do this. But hopefully our brain overrides our emotions. <laughs> so how I respond when I go out into the workplace, how people see me, am I living what I really am, that tire? What happens when the tire falls off? God has to reset the stewardship. When Peter looked at Jesus and he said, I don't know you, I don't know you, I don't know you, the rooster crew, one look. He didn't have to say a word. He reset Peter's stewardship. So that is the entire circumference of everything that makes the Christian life roll. That's where our Christianity and what we really believe encounters the rough and tumble aspects of life. What is interesting is that money intersects everything you do. That's the common denominator and if I understand it right, what you do with money is a precursor to what you deal with and how you deal with all the bigger issues. That's why it's so important that we teach people how to manage their money. Number 11, debt. 
Um, speaking about uh, trillions of dollars, I was at the debt clock in New York City. It's $20 trillion now, right off of uh, Times Square. The world will never go back because they operate on a borrow and spend, but God's plan is save and invest. I redefine the word save, meaning everything I do from my retirement to everyday living expenses, investing is in heaven. Uh, let's see, number 12 is the habits of a steward. Let me mention just a couple of words about a habit. We are not robots. Habits do not happen automatically. To make a habit happen, it always requires a decision. If you allowed your brain to do what it wanted to, it would turn everything you and I do into a habit because it's interested in conserving energy. It wants to take the path of least resistance. So, here's the three components of a habit. Number one, there is a trigger in the triggering event or a cue. Let's say a person smokes tobacco. They get home, they eat supper, the triggering event. They sit in that chair. Oh yeah, there's the triggering event. Then they have to make a decision. But because it's gone over and over and over and over, they make the decision very, very easy. Then the pathway, that is the next step. You have the cue, the, re the routine, the behavior. They light up, they sit there having a good time because the third component is the reward. The three components of a habit. In the brain between cells, there's what is called myelin. And it wraps around the, the connections from cell to cell. The habits that are really fixed, the myelin is thicker. When you have a habit, it is nearly impossible to break. Nearly impossible. Because you want the reward. You want the behaviors even good. And the cue, you know, like some people are addicted to shopping at a mall. What do they recommend? The experts. This is really smart. Take a different pathway home. <laughs> Break that triggering event. Okay. Then there's outcomes, 13. The outcomes of a steward is living a godly life. It's happiness. It is vocational. And I'm going to end with the word uh, contentment. From chaos to contentment. I'm not talking about somebody that it doesn't want to change their theology. They are content. In other words, if you were to say to me, John, why don't you have a beer with us tonight? I am content without beer. Why don't you have some chicken? I was raised a vegetarian. I couldn't get it down and keep it down if my life depended on it. It doesn't have much to do with religion. I am content in being a vegetarian. I want to live better even. So there are outcomes, but the outcome that I like the best is when God says, well done, two words, or he will say three words. Do you know what they are? Depart from me. Which one would you like to hear? And here's the part I do not understand. Again, in the spirit of prophecy, and I think it's in the quarterly or companion book. When God opens the gate and he says, well done, and we go in, he's going to give us our tithe and our offering back. I don't understand it, but I'll take it. You won't need it there. So what does it mean to be well done? I know you're doing some little video clips. Uh, Tiago came up from uh, South America and we did a couple of two-minute clips, one clip for each chapter. And so I'm going to show you uh, the one for chapter 13. It's on well done. 
Have you ever heard the words, well done? I haven't heard them very often, but the time I did hear it, I will never forget. When I was going through school, my academic career wasn't the greatest. Oh yeah, I've been on some academic probations, college, seminary, but I got through, ended up being a pastor. And I get into all kinds of situations as a pastor does, and I came to the realization, maybe I need some more schoolwork. But um, I thought I won't be able to get more schoolwork on a doctorate level because of my grades. So I started taking classes anyway, and I didn't tell the teachers much of anything. I would go into the class, out of the class, take the test, and do the homework until everything was done except the dissertation. And then that school found this guy's on academic probation. They said, you have a problem. We have a problem. You need to get a hold of us. I still have that letter, by the way. And then a week later, I got another letter saying, based on your performance on the doctorate level, we are going to waive the academic probation. Please apply for candidacy. So I did. I did my dissertation. I never studied so hard, wrote so much to prove so little. But I got her done. I'll never forget the day I stood on the platform and the major professor messed with the tassel and he shook my hand and he said, John, well done. I know both sides of the academic career. And I enjoyed hearing those words, well done, but they pale in comparison when Jesus says to us, well done. Mm -hmm.